Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Soldiers of Cinema podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Cullen McFader. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy, howdy with my con- <laughs> my countrified co-host, I guess. You're trying new things out, right? <laughs> You're trying new yeah. things out. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm Clark Coffey, and uh, we are Soldiers of Cinema, and we're happy you're here. Today, in this episode, we are going to be discussing Spike Lee's 1989 film, Do the Right Thing. Mm -hmm. Ooh-wee. It's gonna be a scorcher today. Universal Pictures presents a new film from Spike Lee. Good morning, Miss Mother's sister. Now, Mookie, don't work too hard today. The man says it's going to be hot as the devil. I've been here 25 years. The South's famous pizzeria is here to stay. Trust me. Mookie, the last time I trusted you, we ended up with the sun. I know you can't stand it. You can't stand it. Hey, hey, Sal, I'm going to burst on a wall here. You want brothers on the wall? Love. Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. What I tell you about that noise? What I tell you about them pictures? You got some brother talk to him. You the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. No, you the man. The first time you turn your back, boom. Ah! Right here, man, in the back. Y'all take a chill. You like to sign a petition to boycott Sal's famous pizzeria? Hear me what you ought to do is boycott that no good barber that messed up your head. And that's the double truth. You know, deep down inside, I think you wish you were black. <laughs> Who told you to step on my sneakers? Who told you to walk on my side of the block? Who told you to be in my neighborhood? I own this brownstone. Who told you to buy a brownstone on my block in my neighborhood on my side of the street? I can't even hear myself think! From Spike Lee, director of School Days, and she's gotta have it. Good people, please! If we don't stop this, no, we can stop it now. We're gonna do something we're gonna regret for the rest of our lives. Doctor? Come on, what? What? Always do the right thing. That's it? That's it. I got it. I'm gone. I'm excited to discuss this one. Um, and, you know, I, I'm almost, gosh, I was tempted to like jump right in to, to my uh, personal, like kind of my personal experience with this film when it first came out, I was 13. But before I do so, I want to I wanna hand it over to you and, uh, and kind of hear your, um, your personal experience with the film. It's kind of how we always like to start when you first saw it and kind of what your impression was of it and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, so my uh, first time I saw this would have been it was quite an academic kind of thing because I was I was ah. in school I was at university okay. um, wasn't that in was film a... school but I was in a film class okay like it's an elective yeah um, and so w- this was one of the I believe this was I took like three simultaneously simultaneous film courses and one was a first year one like the entry level one and then two other ones were in upper year courses and I'm trying to remember if this was in the like 101 class or what but anyhow it was it was the first time I'd seen it I was 19 um yeah and uh yeah I remember I liked it a lot um and it's like kind of an interesting like there's pros and cons to kind of seeing something for the first time like that because bet, on yeah. one hand you get a pretty good opportunity to discuss it and really think about it and kind of dissect it in a lot of okay, ways. Okay, now then we're expecting a high bar here then from yes, your side yeah, on I've this got, podcast because like, yeah, you I mean <laughs> read off of my papers and all that, you know. Um but on the other hand I also find that making things super academic can often at least in my opinion, kind of dilute a conversation. And when you when you get so far into the like didactics of theory and and these like very specific and in some ways strict definitions of certain mm. like film theory elements and, and mm. or just elements of film in general that it can kind of limit a conversation. Yeah. Um I remember one thing that kind of stuck out to me was uh Describing at one point in in the class, um, what I thought was a pretty normal thing as a filmmaker, because I had been making movies 
before then when I was in this class anyhow. So I kind of already had that side of the experience. And I remember at one point trying to, to have a discussion about like the filmmaker's intention, about like Spike Lee's intentions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the professor was sort of stopping me and saying, well, you know, we don't really think about the filmmaker's intentions. The filmmaker's intentions are irrelevant. And that kind of took me aback because I was like, that doesn't really make sense. Because I feel like if you're looking at something through a scope where you're, you're disregarding intentions and only looking at result, you're limiting yourself on what you are actually able to take in about whatever work it is. And especially something like this where intentions do matter so much because there is such a rich um, like depth to to the subject matter of this movie yeah so i thought that it like so on one hand yeah it was it was a good opportunity to kind of discuss the movie and be able to um you know f work out the theory and and kind of think about it in that sense but i think having you know grown beyond that and grown beyond perhaps the things that i i learned and discussed in that class i think i got more out of it this time um just on the basis that on like I've, a personal level yeah like i've yeah. i mean a i've i've grown slightly older um <laughs> and on the you know more life experience the world sure. has also changed quite a bit since since and, then that was and stayed the same in some and ways stayed, yeah in a lot of ways too. things yeah. are the same but also very different like yeah exactly good point um so i think you just like i think you just approach it i don't know you know I don't know if I would feel any different about this if this was my first time seeing it. Like, I feel like I had a pretty fresh experience with it this yeah. time in, in that, like, I, again, I think just because of the distance that I've had, there's obviously a huge difference between 19 and 25, despite the fact that it's not that long of a time. Um, yeah, I would say, So yeah, I just think that yeah. on that basis, I think that I, I had a very fresh kind of experience not that my opinion of it has changed much. I like, I've, I've always liked it. I liked it a lot the first time I saw it and I liked it a lot now. Um, yeah. But I think that I, I think I'm better equipped to have the conversation about this movie now than I was, um, you know, back then. Yeah. All those yeah. years ago. Yeah, that's interesting. It's an interesting thing to think kind of, you know, how being, ex you know, kind of experiencing a film in that setting, you know, and it's like, it's part of a class, it's part of a, a curriculum, you, you're, to some extent, you know, you're having to perform in some manner, I would assume, to earn a grade, right? It's like either your discussion is graded, or you're writing a paper about it, or you're having some kind of test. I mean, there's some, some way they have to kind of confine, you know, the, the, your response to it in a way that they can grade it. You know, mm -hmm. and so yeah. maybe that was part of, you know, the limitation of like, OK, well, hey, look, we have to we're, we're going to arbitrarily limit ourselves to this is what's this is in the film. And then we're not going to take any context outside of that into account, you know, and I can understand that. But, yeah, I would say, on a, you know, on a, I can imagine on a personal level, though, uh, kind of, you know, having so much structure uh, of the, you know, the academic experience around it uh changes it and i definitely i didn't go to film school myself either uh but i did take some film classes uh in college like like you were describing and yeah i mean it's you know there were kind of pros and cons to that you know for sure like you just described so that's interesting to kind of compare that experience to this experience now and it's kind of interesting that you you felt like this was almost watching it anew mm -hmm. um for me uh I, it's been a long time since i had seen the film I think I've probably seen it, you know, it, I, gosh, I don't even actually know how many times I've seen the film. Uh, not that it's a, a terribly high number, but probably at least, you know, maybe half a dozen times or so over, you know, uh, the, all the years that it's been released. But I do, you know, remember watching this film and I was 13 when it was released. I didn't see it in the theater. So I almost certainly saw it, you know, a year or two later when it came out on cable television or I rented it. Um, you know, I definitely knew who Spike Lee was at that time. And, uh, I mean, Spike Lee was, uh, you know, especially in the United States, I don't know if this is also the case in Canada, but I mean, he was a pretty substantial, like, you know, popular cultural icon, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, he was, I, I don't remember the exact timing of things, but probably by the time this had been out for a, a couple of years, which is when I would have seen it at home. I mean, he was Mars Blackman in the Air Jordan commercials, which were all over the place. And of course, Air Jordans were insanely popular. 
Um, and so like, you know, and he was a big part of that. His commercials were like iconic and, and his portrayal of Mars Blackman was iconic, which of course was a character from an earlier of his films. And she's got to have it from like, I think 86 or so. And, um, and so, you know, and he had like, really this film was, was both controversial, but also, you know, I mean, I think recognized rightfully so as, as such a, a superb film that it was just like, it was, it was just, he was all over the place. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I yeah. had a, a, a context of him as a filmmaker um, and as like this, this kind of, uh, I, I guess you could even say at that time, even iconic would be even the right word to use this iconic public figure. Right. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, I remember watching the film. So I probably was like 14, 15 years old. And I remember watching it and being pretty profoundly moved by it, like just personally, emotionally. It's funny too. I, how how much I had forgotten when I watched it last night in preparation for this, there were so many memories came back to me of like, you know, thing like the writing is 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 so especially unique in 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 so many areas of this film that there's there was just so many things that stuck with that like I remember oh my gosh, like that really had an impression on me, but I had mm -hmm. kind of forgotten where that impression had come from over time. And then watching it now, I, it like reminded me, I was like, oh, it that was from this film, you know? Oh my gosh, that was also from this film. Just yeah. Yeah. the iconic characters, the writing, just so many things um, kind of burned into my young, like, you know, preteen or young teen brain when I watched this film. And um, I think it was a big part of, you know, for me, along with a, a lot of the films that were coming out in that era of like, you know, kind of now this I don't think it was an independent film, but this is a low budget film. And it's it feels very much, honestly, like an independent film to me yeah. in, in its like style and in its the perspective that's strong, like the strong auteur this is clearly spike this is mm -hmm. clearly his vision this is clearly not a homogenized studio film and it had you know very much had that feel and so this with a lot of films that i think were coming out and we've talked about some in previous episodes i think you know like kevin smith's clerks uh, quentin tarantino's reservoir dogs and um you know, soderbergh was uh coming out at this time too and all that stuff kind of for started to formulate like my vision of what a director could be and what a film could be and the range of that and that you could potentially do this, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. that it like, you know, and that there was room for different voices, different perspectives. You're and allowed to break rules that you're yeah. It, and, and, and that you're also allowed to talk about a lot of different subject matter. And mm -hmm. I mean, you can make a film that's just purely entertaining, but you can also make a film that touches on some really um, important, significant uh, subject matter, you know, that. Um, so, yeah, I so I feel like this is, you know, one of, you know, a handful of films in my early life that had a big impact on me uh, in a lot of different ways. You know, it's I, there's been a handful of films where I've just been like, yeah, this was one of those films that just expanded my understanding of what a director could be and what a film could be. Yeah. And they and they yeah. and that you could do it, you know, the proverbial you that, that anyone, all of us, any of us could do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's it was huge. And then watching the film now, and uh, I gosh, I'm really surprised. I, I think a few things that you know, I probably wouldn't have paid conscious attention to this when I was a kid, although I certainly would have been impacted by it. Just the the virtuosity technically of this film is something mm -hmm. that it, one of the things that I think surprised me. And it's, I think, complexity of characterization. And it's, and the film's like, uh, confidence to not try to, to present a lot of nuanced challenges in a really complex, for a really complex thing like racism and race relations in the United States. Yeah. 
Yeah. But to not feel compelled to to just provide some kind of like pat answer for like here's how we solve it. You know, because I think yeah. that takes no, exactly. confidence, and I think a lot of other films try to kind of present some pretty like you know uh, just overly simplified to the point of often insulting you know answers for you know racism like just bring in the great white hope or whatever other number of things that movies often try to do you know to present a happy ending you know at the end well i think Um, that's one of my favorite things about the movie like one of my favorite moments is when the credits start to roll and you have the quote from martin luther king scroll by and you sort of think like huh i'm surprised that he's taking like a really kind of concrete stance on this. And then as it goes up, <laughs> then you get the, the you get the, the converse contrasting quote from or, you know, X. Yeah. and it becomes this really, really genius point that, that brings me back to our discussion about um, last temptation where Scorsese is talking about that. It's not about providing the audience with answers, answers and preaching to them. It's yeah. about eliciting conversation. I'm sure that Spike Lee very likely has an opinion of his own, um, that maybe leans one way or the other more so. And mm-hmm. yet I think he's more interested in getting these conclusions. A conclusion is always going to be more powerful when someone comes to it on their own after having mm. thought about it, as opposed yeah. to having been specifically told this is what's right. right and this is what's wrong. And I think that yeah. that really is the genius of this movie. Mm. Um, and the, the tone works so well with it too. Mm. Um, I'm going to compare it to another movie too, because Oh, this is a more odd comparison, but it's actually something similar that I said way back when we re- did this movie. Um, but it reminds me in in its tonal shift, sort of uh, reminds me of um, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Oh, and okay, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. that. Okay, I'm curious because Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is a, is is quite a lighthearted um, movie where like it's dealing with you know sure violence and and things like that, but it kind of does so in this tongue-in-cheek kind of like you don't really feel like anyone's going to get hurt in it until the moment when butch makes his first kill Mm. and that is when there's this massive tonal shift and and it can be a really difficult thing to pull off because you're suddenly going from this like kind of tongue-in-cheek like the violence isn't really consequential to suddenly the character feels the consequences of that and when it's so far into a movie it can be really difficult to pull that off successfully and not Mm. kind of make an audience feel either alienated or just have it be jarring and kind of be like, where'd this come from? And this movie does it the same way where the subject matter is, is treated sincerely and with so much nuance and yet it's heightened and it's humorous and it's it's poking fun at, at a lot of the like really strong convictions that a lot of these characters have, not Mm -hmm. in a mocking way, but kind of in just this, this way of like, you know, it's just kind of heightening it to the to the point of, of ridiculous in, in in a sense, and then you get to the culmination of of the tension and the and the boil in this movie, and then it becomes really real and it becomes very stark mm. and very dramatic. And this mm. movie also pulls it off, I think, really really well. Um, Interesting. With yeah. the with the uh, the riot at the end where it it just. It goes well, from with this the... fantastic tone of of like this almost advertisement like tone and the, the color is rich and the, the lenses are wide and it reminds me a lot of advertising from this era and especially into the nineties, which I'm sure were also heavily influenced by this, very mm. likely. Like when I was growing up, um, a lot of ads still kind of had that like super wide angle, really, really saturated color palette kind of style in it and in doing so, it portrays this world as, again, this like very, very heightened, but not simplistic, um, kind of like almost. This is going to be a weird comparison because, and I don't mean it in a, in a demeaning way, but like almost a Sesame Street kind of thing where it's like, because I think actually, like I really do respect Sesame Street a lot. Weirdly enough, for the way that it approaches its its complex, you're making some interesting issues. parallels here. I <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, it's just it's well, one of these things where it like it it plays up a lot of the the anger anger and the tension and the uh, characterization. I think to drive the point home of of how big these things feel to the people on the ground, and well, so think... it plays up at that, and it uses humor to kind of play those things up, and then when the proverbial shit hits the fan suddenly 
again, you really feel it because of that, because you're, you're like, it suddenly kind of grounds you and brings, snaps you out and brings you back into reality, which I think is a brilliant move. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, I think too, just to add to some of what you're saying, but, the, but I kind of want to come back here and, and work our way to this point as we discuss mm -hmm. other aspects of the film. But I mean, what, what I get a sense of is a vibrancy of a community, right? I yeah. mean, and yeah. I think, I think these technical choices that you're calling out specifically, you know, the vibrancy of the, of the, the color palette that you used in the film and, and some of the Lynch choices and, and the, the kineticism of the camera and other things. I, and it's also in the writing and it's in the performances is that, I, I mean, I get a sense of an extremely vibrant community. Mm -hmm. We get mm -hmm. to see, we get to meet a lot of different characters in the community. And, you know, even the characters that we might not get to spend a ton of time with, they're still drawn in a way that we understand them. And there's and I think Spike Lee is extremely sympathetic to all of his characters, right? And to every character, there's some sympathy, um, at, at least somewhere, um, which I think is important. And so it's a vibrancy that we're shown in this community. And and I think when we get to the point where uh, Radio Rahim is killed, right? And we have, you know, he comes into the into the pizza joint, into Sal's, and they have a confrontation. And Sal smashes his boombox. And I think that's, you know, the point where the film does really change in its tone. Mm -hmm. And and then, of course, when Radio Rahim is, is killed um, by the police, then obviously very clearly the tone has changed. And then we have the uh, destruction of the pizza parlor in response to that murder. And so you really do, you see almost the vibrancy of that community kind of drained um, mm -hmm. by this this really horrible event um but then we also spike we have kind of a denouement and in kind of the the remains and the rubble of that event we see the vibrancy start to creep back in again mm -hmm. as we as we leave the film as the credits begin to roll as you describe so i you know i think um i think those choices at least my kind of you know the way i kind of felt it was was such a vibrant living community is kind of the the vibe that i got from the culmination of all of those technical aspects so mm -hmm. let's let's talk yeah. about that a little more then like because i think it's there there are some extremely strong choices directorially here and um and, and i i think we could talk about that a little more i mean again this is what i was surprised by i mean there are some really just extraordinary shots here I um I really appreciate this film has almost none of the traditional you know over the shoulder over the shoulder you know yeah I'm like yeah I'm like oh thank you thank you it's like I feel so just you know almost everything we see today seems to be uh, especially with television which is supposed to be quote unquote more cinematic today and I would argue that in a lot of ways it's not actually and unfortunately it has influenced a lot of films a lot of mm -hmm. cinema. Yeah. Um, I think more things look like television now than they ever had. And what that means to me is that you just see, you know, two people talking over the shoulder, over the shoulder. Just you know, it's coverage. Like, <laughs> just is 80% of the entire uh, show. And we yeah. see almost none of that here. And we see these really, you know, often there's a lot of camera movement. We see a lot of reframing within a shot. There's uh, some really interesting oneers that actually hardly even stand out to you because it's mm -hmm. they almost seem like they're multiple shots edited together. Well, yeah, because, there's there's multiple setups within them right? because and there's so it's, it, yeah. it's beautiful um, and and like we'd already talked about you know that there's really some beautiful kind of tableaus we have and it's interesting it's almost like and I don't want to say that Spike Lee is like Wes Anderson at all but there's almost like this kind of this theatrical you know nature that you kind of talk about where there's almost this like a a, a, a you know like the 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 Greek chorus of the three mm -hmm. men sitting yeah. on the sidewalk in front of the the flat red the bright red wall there's a really beautiful moment where which I thought it's one of one of the the shots that I think is most uh, just really strikingly beautiful is when Ossie Davis's character, the mayor, is talking to Ruby D, uh, Ruby D's character, and he's standing in front of this beautiful silhouette of the city 
with the mm-hmm. blue sky and all you know and the buildings totally blacked out in silhouette and it's actually and i don't know if they used a rain machine or if it was actually some you know raining but there's just this light rain behind him it's just extraordinarily beautiful there's a, there's mm-hmm. so much beauty in this and um that I, I I had forgotten a lot of that was in it, or maybe I'd kind of missed it or just didn't know how to articulate it. But a lot of that, I was really surprised. I mean, it's like so, so beautifully shot. In well, so it's ways. so specific too. I mean, it's like, it, it, it's, it's one of those things where you, you really have a sense of Spike Lee's prowess as a filmmaker when these moments can feel so natural and improvised and you know, they're not. And that he can right. give this feeling of like again this this reframing a camera in the middle of action or in the middle of conversation, mm. and it feels like the camera is just finding the yeah. new position, finding the moment, yeah, finding the moment, yeah. Clearly, because of how precise it is, it's clearly something that's planned. But to to make those things feel natural and feel like they belong in a scene is really really um, well, impressive. and especially on a six million dollar budget. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> and shooting on location. This yeah. stuff is tough. Yeah. I mean, to get to get this at that, even in 89, $6 million is not a ton of money. And to get this on location where you've got, I mean, it's as far as I understand, the entire film was shot on location. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think they, they built a pizzeria that wasn't something I think that was pre-existing because they had to destroy it. I'm not 100% sure if they built the structure or just the interior, but... Um, I mean, that's it's extremely difficult because you've you've got so many variables that are so kind of out of your control. I mean, you can't control the weather, the sun, you know, obviously. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff going on around you. Well, even and so I think it's even that, more impressive just given given that, you know. Yes. Yeah. And one thing that really that stuck out to me immediately, um, like within the first shot of the movie is how how much I miss directors and cinematographers being this stylized because i mean the first thing you see is this street and you just think this feels hot like just without any other context Mm. the the fact that they've clearly got some sort of like uh, a warm filter over it and they've they've processed the film to to be definitely a warmer hue and it's kind of blooming and and a little bit overexposed and it just feels hot and it feels and it, it it contrasts so much with kind of what you were saying earlier um, about like you you look at the vast majority of mainstream film and television these days and everything has to be exposed perfectly pro- like properly <laughs> it's all going to be you know framed with like the rule of thirds um like this day and age if you were making a movie like this where it's set during a heat wave and stuff you wouldn't see nearly this level i mean with exceptions obviously of course there are there are excellent dps and directors still working today but in terms of just like your your standard fare, you wouldn't see nearly this amount of effort just put into the look alone of making it feel hot and making you sweat just looking well, that's, at the image. And that's such a key part of the of the story too. You know, it's yeah, this. Yeah. It's this. It, right, we have a day in the life. Basically, it's like kind of a slice of life of this neighborhood, and and really everything is kind of centered around, you know, taking us in this day to this you know climactic um you know horrific event and the heat is like that you know it's it's kind of true realistically where you know historically you have extremely high temperatures in a city there tends to be more violence which people Mm -hmm. just get you know it's just get get impatient they just you get impatient you get you're uncomfortable people's tempers are you you know shorter um but it serves so well to kind of create this pressure cooker you know, or, or, you know, turn up the heat, <laughs> um, uh, on, on what is already kind of a, a, a boiling, you know, kettle kind of ready to go. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's so many choices that, that work so well in that, but you, you know, you talk about style and not being afraid to really lean into that. I mean, with the, it's just exploding with personality and, mm-hmm. and it's really, wonderful to experience as an audience i mean uh whether it's like you know uh sam jackson's uh, character who's kind of it's you know it's almost part of a greek chorus kind of narrator you know his um radio dj you've got you know the the three men sitting out kind of a more traditional greek uh, greek chorus 
you've got these fourth wall breaks. You've got this like beautiful moment where Radio Mother, Rahim sister is too. like love, hate, you mm-hmm. know, and and it's almost and it's like this poetry. You know, it's almost like we're just going to stop and we're going to break the fourth wall. And we've got this, you know, this little this monologue that this poetic monologue that was really beautifully done. You've got the fourth wall break when you have we just like go from character to character, character kind of, you know, just spitting as fast as possible, like all these like racial slurs they could possibly, you know, think of. Right. Yeah. And and it, and it works because it's. It and it it's just it it you could so easily destroy a film by doing something like that, but it works so wonderfully in this film, so well executed, um, as part of like you say, it, it's, we've already got kind of the 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 expectation is set that this is going to be heightened and stylized, but it also everything flows right into where Lee is taking us. You never feel like you're not in good hands, right? Yeah. Like you you always feel as an audience that you're in good hands here and that it's not going to go astray. And it's the, the writing is so crisp. The performances are so excellent. And the way he weaves e- these even highly stylized moments into the story um, and they contribute to the characterization and they contribute to the tone that you talked about. Well, he, he does. Um, I've never it's... seen stuff like that. I don't think I'm yeah. trying to think. Like when I first saw this film, I don't know that I'd ever seen. I mean, I've tried. I'll be. I mean, I can't go. You know, it's so long ago. I mean, I, but it, this is the. Even if I had seen something like this fourth wall breaking, I I I can't remember. Like this is the only one that that actually stands out in my mind. If I even ever did see it done somewhere mm-hmm. else, because it's done so well here, right? Um. And I had never seen anything like that. I'm like, well, he does something that's really smart, I think, though, too, (laughs) which is that that in the in the opening credits, he presents the image of the like the women dancing on a backdrop of brownstones, Mm -hmm. not real brownstones, and so you immediately oh, and Rosie Perez, what you mean in the in the in the 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 credit yeah the opening credit sequence when Rosie Perez is dancing? Yes, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, and um. And so you get this this sense of theatricality immediately, mm-hmm. and I think even beyond that, like going back to Radio Rahim's monologue, um, what that makes like that brings my mind to the fact that in uh, you know a stage production, you don't you know you can't cut from a character being in a scene to suddenly delivering some fourth wall break. Uh, somewhere else like you can't Mm -hmm. cut like that and so i think spike lee does something really really neat which is that you actually have radio raheem um talking like in a conversation in a in a two shot and then the camera steps over into the the like receiving end of that conversation's place like where the yeah and 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 we where the character was monologue head on point of view like he's looking straight at camera yeah and i think that that's really really that part always like I, I almost had forgotten that 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 happened that way and it it like kind of blew me away this time because of the way that it just happens so fluidly and suddenly we're being talked to and there's not even like time to question it it yeah. just is so confident in its ability to do so and mm. to take that step um and it just feels so theatrical in this way that i i think is a really really strong bridge between like i there's there's oftentimes there's these movies that people always talk about that are like oh it's like a stage play it's like theatrical and because it's just like people talking in a room or something whatever right um and i find that that stuff always kind of bores me a little bit unless it's like incredibly well done because it it's not taking advantage of the medium in which it's in it's just trying to sort of recreate another medium yep this is taking inspiration from theater but adapting it to the medium that it's in and adapting it well and using the advantages of film and the language of film to kind of evolve those those uh, elements. And I, I think that that really, really stuck out to me, especially this time, um, as something that makes this feel completely unique. Um, and I'm with you in, the, in that I don't think I've seen like fourth wall breaks like this really ever like in anything predating this um and i definitely don't think i've seen them done as well since yeah um i think that people have kind of picked up on that and tried to kind of do that style i mean this movie is a is a 
greatly influential movie um, for still to this day. Um, but I don't think that anyone's ever quite nailed it like like Spike I, Lee I mean at least here. I can't think of anything off the top of my head I, I can't I, you know maybe there is but you know uh, it escapes me now I, I couldn't think of of a film that does it better than this one so mm-hmm. um yeah if if other people have examples you can email us but uh, I can't think of any off the top of my head and I but and all of this I mean there's even you know there's this throughout the entire film we've got Dutch angles all over the place yeah. I think you had mentioned, you know, the the wide angle lenses. And it's just, there's so much going on. Um, and I guess that's why, you know, the feeling I get is is just this, this kinetic, vibrant. People are all, you know, constantly on the move. People, you know, Radio Rakim is in the background walking from one place to the other in this, you know, with a radio. We've got Smiley coming in and out of scenes. I mean, there's this... The mayor is always kind of stumbling around somewhere. And I don't, and I, you know, and I know it's like, you know, um, we we pick these things apart sometimes in films, um, but I think it's a it's important. It's what we do here is to kind of sometimes we get really nitty gritty because I think it it's it helps evaluate the film. It's kind of uh, it helps you give greater insight. We don't want to obviously lose the forest for the trees, but. I, you know, one of the most amazing shots that I can remember uh, this time, there's this really exceptional scene where Sal is talking to um, uh, to Toro. I for, is that Pino? Um, I can't remember. Uh, no, Vito is to Toro, I think. Okay, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you've got um, Sal's talking to his son and... And we're we're pushing in, we're pushing in. It's like a dolly in. I think we might even go like over a table. They're inside the mm-hmm. restaurant, right? And there's this big pl- you know, picture window, window, which which is going to be where I think Mookie throws the trash can, you know, later uh, at the end of the film. Yeah. But but we've got this deep focus. We can see everything. We see the Korean uh, convenience store across the street in the background, um, just off out of the scene but we can hear and so sound is used so well here too so you know the focus is in on, on this conversation they're sitting you know across from each other at this table we dolly in dolly in dolly in we come in close and now we're looking outside the window conversation still going on deep focus you know we can see the uh korean store owners behind us there's life is going on we see one of the guys um f- who were sitting in front of the wet wall wet uh, the red wall comes into frame, buys a beer, leaves, there's people moving, then Smiley comes in and bangs on the glass behind them. Now the scene, you know, moves outside, Detoro goes outside, trying to shoo Smiley away. We have But the camera stays in, right? The like camera's the camera, right yeah. there. And it's just, there's, and so it's just, it's such a confident use of depth. And I think we've talked about this before, where we just we don't see a lot of of storytelling and depth much anymore, but the coordination of all those elements and of the sound design and bring it again, it's taking such care to to build this community and to show it spatially and to have a continuity of of characters coming and going and being a part of things. I think is a huge part of the success of this film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it and I think it 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 it's so effective when we build up to the place where that vibrancy is so sadly drained when when we have these you know the everything comes to a head and we have uh, Radio Rakim killed and we have the destruction of the of the um, pizza parlor. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, I yeah, I'm sorry. I think I got in a little rabbit hole there on that scene because it was just so amazing. You know, yeah, that, that's that, a great scene. Though, it's just think. such a, you know, and there are so many like it. But, you know, I think, you know, when it's it's interesting, I think, you know, when the film was released, it, this was this was especially interesting. Uh, I guess I, I'm going to like jump for a second to something else here. But um, on the Blu-ray that I have, there was a, um, the, the, this movie premiered at Khan, and there was, I guess, like the Q&A after the screening was on the Blu-ray. And so I took some time to watch that. 
And it was especially interesting. I was, I was, a couple of things that, that stood out to me that I noticed was one, I was surprised by the, 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 how to say this, like the lack of thoughtfulness that was in most of the questions that were asked. I, I've never been to con and I don't watch a lot of interviews or, you know, like Q and A's and things from con. So I'm not quite sure like what the, you know, the standard is like the average is for the caliber mm -hmm. of questions that are asked by the press there. I'm not sure, but, but you would think, I guess most of these people were press from like, you know, the, the entertainment section or the cinema, you know, the, they were cinema, they were, you know, supposed to be cinema oriented, right? You know, <laughs> it wasn't yeah. like there were just general reporters there. Like these are supposed to be people who, like entertainment reporters for or, or even specifically or, film. Yeah. 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 Not just entertainment, but like actual cinema. Yeah. And, and so I was kind of surprised by or let down, frankly, by the general caliber of questions that were asked. And, you know, I, nobody there that I at least remember talked about any of the things that we're talking about here, which is the virtuosity of the filmmaking itself, of all of these elements and how well they've been put together to tell a story. But um, it was also interesting to notice that a lot of people seem to be focused on the fear that this film would instigate violence in black audiences. And being so young, I don't remember that being a part of the conversation when I was, you know, when this film first came out, because I, I was so young. Um, and maybe I was exposed to some of that. And I just don't remember, but it was very clear in, in this, uh, in this, this Q and a that, uh, that took place at con after the premiere, that that was, that was obviously a thing. And apparently that was a thing pretty widespread. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting that, that I guess that that overtook so much of the conversation away from you know even away from like the fact that the 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 message of you know radio rakim being killed by police people just seem to kind of a lot of people seem to go straight to the uh fact that there that the pizza parlor that there was a riot there um which is interesting and telling i think but also well, just also, that there was it actually kind of involves itself in the movie where the at the end the the there's like the little radio report about the mayor coming to like the real mayor coming to visit mm -hmm. and mm. they say there will like we will not stand for property violence yeah okay. no mention yes. of yes the, the no murder, mention right? of the police violence right yeah which is which is obviously something that still happens to this day here in this yeah. country yeah. um but i guess to i guess i almost want you know it's i i guess there was, i was just surprised that unlike many films it seems like there was not much conversation about the again the the skill and the talent and the the that was that was that this that's in this film as a film itself you know mm -hmm. so um but it was yeah that was just it was uh, it was interesting that that was and I'm glad that was included because uh I think it was important to see a slice of kind of what people were thinking and how they were responding to this film in its time yeah, Which, and to also put con into context, uh, like Spike Lee's frustration to this day with yeah. with those things too. Like he still talks about um, the fact that it it really really uh, bothered him that and still bothers him to this day that he that you know there was this this kind of infantilization of like can people handle this? Can people mm. and and well, he and he, but specifically, his, I think a can, great can thing black that he people says, handle this? Yes, is what exactly. the question was. Yeah, and and a great thing that he says too is that he he's like you know you don't you never hear this about you know yeah or is Rambo going to cause people right. coming out of the of the I theater mean, killing people right so very very rarely at least at at, at a much less level for sure mm -hmm. um, yeah which is you know and, and I can only imagine how frustrating that would be as a filmmaker uh, to have you know, to pour your heart and soul into something and, and, uh, to have the message. So like to have your work kind of just, you know, totally pushed aside, you know, and have the focus be put on something, uh, so, uh, insulting. Um, yeah. 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 Um, well, I think that also, I mean, I think that that also is a, a probably a good point to get into. Like, I think, and I think we both kind of talked about this a little bit about the these two characters of of Radio Raheem and Smiley, mm -hmm. and kind of their representation in the film yeah. and what they what they 
mean because we were sort of discussing this at these elements of different characters beforehand of like the Greek chorus and that you've got all these characters weaving in and out. And of course, Radio Rahim has his monologue about love and hate, mm -hmm. which is very similar. And I, I think intentionally so to the Night of the Hunter monologue where, you know, you've mm. got the the knuckles and it's kind of like a play on that in, in a lot of ways. And I think Spike Lee has talked about that. Um, Tell, say but, a little more. I'm not familiar with it. So, so Night of... well, Night of the Hunter is a... Uh, a movie from god what is it um I'm trying to think of what year that was 55 i believe um by uh charles lawton and it was his only feature film ever and it's this movie that like people kind of describe as this like incredible uh thriller that is also like has so much depth and 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 just a very very masterful movie and and they're always surprised that it was his only feature i think because and what is the moment issues. that you're so in it um robert mitchum plays the villain who is a i can't remember if he's a real preacher or if he's pretending to be a preacher but he's got tattooed on his fingers on his on like just above his knuckles love and hate so okay similarly to uh, radio yeah. Rakim, who was obviously okay. wearing um you know rings yep um he has these things and he has a similar monologue where it's like love and hate are always intertwined and he does ah, the hand he thing. He even to, does the, okay. Yeah, where okay. he intertwines I his hands. I didn't know and, that. Um, but the, I think the way that Spike Lee is playing with it here is that, of course, Robert Mitchum is playing a the villain in mm -hmm. that film and describing these, whereas Radio Rahim is kind of playing a little bit more of a, I don't want to say like prophetic, but he is kind of almost describing the events that will carry out uh mm. later on in the film very much in part due to like his own circumstances and what happens with him in the film but i do yeah. find that those characters smiley and uh Ray rahim are are really interesting too because at least and this is speculation on my part but the way that i see those two characters is that they that's are always speculation being... we're always yes, just of speculating. course yeah, yeah that's what all these discussions are <laughs> unless we had spike lee here which you know he, right he said that he was busy today so yeah um, but uh I think that those two characters are really interesting because they kind of are like the these two different sides of the same coin in that they both kind of flow through the movie without necessarily interacting directly with the drama. Um, they're they're sort of these wanderers in a way, like like Smiley will come in for a moment and and say something about his pictures of of Malcolm X and MLK. Um but is kind of, you know, waved off by characters. And in, in the most dramatic waving off, of course, is John Totoro as uh, Vito, really, like, essentially shoving him away and I think making him upset, mm -hmm. um, which I think sort of instigates his involvement in the, the kind of boycott at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've also got Radio Rahim, who is kind of portrayed as, as this, like, kind of nonchalant, like, kind of wise in a way like he's he's kind of like a, a like a good orator and he's he's walking around with his music playing and but he's never again he's never really directly involved in the conflicts or in the character drama he's kind of always just like wandering through these scenes as sort of a constant and i think that it's interesting that the climax of the film occurs when of course Ray Rahim's uh beatbox is or boombox is is smashed mm -hmm. um by sal and then the climax even heightens further when radio rahim is killed and then the climax heightens even further when smiley lights the pizza parlor on fire and to me i mean at least my my takeaway for for what these characters are kind of representing in those moments is just that there's this like underlying current through the film this tension that is being ignored and and, and mm shoved off by everyone and kind of mm -hmm. just not acknowledged despite the fact that they are saying like again radio rahim is saying very profound things that it seems like nobody minus maybe a few characters are really listening to and same with smiley he's he's basically describing in his own way the kind of the same thing that spike lee is trying to describe with the movie which is just this this love and hate this like violence versus non-violence and he's and it's the first thing he does when he of course the picture is or maybe together. not even versus it's it's really well, yeah the 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 it, symbiosis this, almost of the two this, right yeah yeah um and and so you have this really i think like again this is just my take on it but i think this really 
not cathartic, but cathartic in like a storytelling kind of sense where you you see these seeds being planted throughout the movie and these characters and you're kind of wondering like how are these going to come into play by the end? And then of course, what a great representation of what's gone on this whole time where people have just been kind of like, and what's, what's the whole thing with Sal and um, Mookie the whole time are both sort of in a similar way. Like Sal keeps kind of, shaking off the fact that he's like, no, I like this neighborhood. I want to be here. I want to, mm-hmm. like, this is this is where I've, I've built up this place my whole life. Well, he literally know, says, he's keeps... like, I've, I've I've seen the kids grow up. They've, yeah, and like, they've Vito grown keeps up trying on my to food. Vito, I, I've seen the old people get older. I've seen the young yeah, people yeah. grow old. And, and I've, like, they've grown up on my food. Yeah, and in the same way, like, Mookie is kind of this, this bridge between that too, where he's, um, like, he's sort of ignoring the potential problems that are that are going on around him and these this these potential boiling points um just in the same way that he sort of like is trying to temporarily relieve the heat um when he's with his girlfriend and he's using the ice cubes and kind of rubbing them all over his bot her body he's like relieving the pressure without actually getting to the root cause which i find is really interesting and Mm -hmm. then of course it explodes um and it to me is very representative of this idea that people will always kind of say like when things like this explode, when um, there's these massive moments of, I think the, the the famous quote is like, you know, history doesn't happen at all. And then all history happens in a week or something mm. like that. I might be butchering that a little bit, but mm. this, this kind of naive thinking that like, well, where did this come from? Like, how did Mm. this happen? How did this Mm -hmm. occur? And yet you have these things occurring the entire time in just the per, like the periphery of everyone that they're just ignoring and they're not listening to and they're not paying attention to. So I think that at least in my takeaway, like the movie is doing a really, really great job of, again, not providing these answers and not saying like, here's this right or wrong, Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, violent reaction to something like oppression is bad. Um, but nonviolence is also, you know, ineffectual or things like that. It's, it's in fact, just kind of asking, what do you think? Kind of, playing off of like the imperfect like there is no right answer there Mm -hmm. is no Mm -hmm. like life is way too complicated to expect there to be some sort of simple solution to the world's problems and i I don't think it's saying that either in a pessimistic way it's in fact saying it in a really just matter of fact yeah critical matter of fact um like interrogative way of like how can we kind of um interact with those sort of elements in, in our lives mm. and, and deal with these problems. So it's it's really, really, I think, interesting and has so much to say um, yeah. and doesn't hide it too. Like it's not subtle with that. And I think in a very smart way, um, it's it's very bold with its its uh, portrayal of these these issues. And I yeah, think spikes yeah. on thoughts. No, it's right up front. Yeah, no, it's not afraid to be right up front. It's not afraid to hide what it's about. Um, and, and nor should it be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, powerful film. And, uh, I, I feel like, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we, uh, had this discussion. I was like, I'm particularly interested to hear your, you know, your kind of, uh, your take on Radio Rakim and Smiley. Um, you know, not that there are any a hundred percent right answers or wrong answers, but, You know, I kind of in watching the film was trying to kind of suss out my own opinions and thoughts. And, you know, Mm -hmm. like there's there are so many things in this film that are emotionally impactful. They're they're effective. Right. Um, That I'm not able to immediately articulate exactly why, you know, which is one of the things that I love doing this podcast with you about, because it's like Mm -hmm. in the discussion, right, like in the actual conversation uh, that we're having in real time. Like I often am able to find my way around to a better understanding and I'm better able to articulate my own kind of thoughts and and feelings and kind of why something impacted me the way it did. Mm-hmm. Um, as I think it's so interesting, you know, Smiley wasn't even that character wasn't even written into the script. That was kind of something that was put in after the fact when the actor kept going to Spike Lee saying, "Hey, you know, I want a part in the film. I want mm-hmm. a part in your film." And Spike Lee finally relented. And they kind of found a way um, to create Smiley together and to have that be a part of the film. And I think it's 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 so interesting that he opens the film 
and he closes the film basically yeah he's kind of yeah. bookends the film and of course like you've mentioned he's he's throughout the film at different points in time and um and so yeah there are you know i i still don't know exactly why i kind of am impacted the way i am but there's so many elements in that film that i think work in that way i mean we could certainly analyze them intellectually which we've done in quite a few ways here but they're also just effective you know mm -hmm. they're just plain effective uh emotionally and um and i think that also sadly is missing from a lot of things that i see you yes. know in yeah. in in films um and it, I think you had said, and I'm curious. I, I want to make sure I heard this right. Did you say that that it was like Spike Lee re, re, wrote the script in, in only two weeks? Is that yeah? Something that and apparently, read, in a Rolling or? Stone interview, he, he says that yeah, he wrote the movie in two weeks, which is crazy. I, I mean, and I don't know to what extent you know there was an edit editing. You know, who mm -hmm. knows? I mean, yeah. maybe he wrote he wrote a draft in two weeks, but then he spent months editing. It. I have no idea. It would be so interesting, and, and I'm going to go out there and look to see if he's you know, spoken more explicitly about, you know, his writing process and, and, how, and, and, and sp specifically with this film. But, but, you know, like, again, we're just speculating, but I'll just speculate. I mean, I wonder how much of this was like, like how he writes. I'm not sure if a lot of this was just kind of like bubbling up from the subconscious that there was, he allowed, he opened himself up as a writer to, to have these elements in the film um, without, like a hyper intellectualized, you know, uh, route to it, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, you know, yeah. where, where it was like, well, there's kind of just, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, and I'm always interested in that, you know, for, for every piece of writing, I'm kind of, it's something that I've been kind of curious about for a while as I try to work on my own writing process, which is kind of this balance of, you know, writing from kind of the shoulders up where you're kind of intellectual about it and you're conscious about it. And it's kind of, you know, versus kind of writing from a more subconscious place where it's more kind of visceral and, and coming from kind of like a dreamlike place of your subconscious and how you, you know, how do you kind of get the best of both worlds? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so yeah, total speculation. I mean, I have no idea, you know, uh, how he writes or, uh, and especially how he wrote uh, this script, but it would be interesting to kind of learn more about it. But from an audience perspective, at least, you know, to me, it feels like there was a lot of room for that, that kind of subconscious to work. And, you know, because you could take all these elements independently, and it would be like, how is this going to work in a film? We're going to have characters speaking, you know, breaking the fourth wall, speaking to the camera, we're going to have these, you know, stops where we kind of have monologues, we're going to have, you know, this character who stutters, book end it we're gonna have you know this guy that's walking around with a boom box and he you know aside from his monologue it's he's kind of he's got public enemies fight the power you know just kind of playing throughout the film mm -hmm. walking in and out of scenes you know what i mean it's like i think about this as from the from the perspective of a writer and i'm like oh my gosh you know he allowed for so much creativity but it was still yet cohesive and emotionally mm -hmm. effective and impactful. It, it's just, it's just rare. It's just, and it's what, it's what makes this a masterpiece in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know if any of that made sense that I, I, I almost, I'm like, no, sometimes totally. I'm afraid I'm like rambling. Well, here, like you but... said, sometimes it's fun to just, it's like, it allows, I think that, that I totally echo that sentiment of like this, this lets the great thing about doing this is that I can sometimes realize things about what we're talking about as we talk about them. And it, yeah. it uh, makes it a lot of fun. You know, the only last thing that I want to, uh, that I want to kind of think about is uh, before we will end this, this episode is that, you know, this film is, I mean, Spike Lee was 32 is still pretty young. It's his third film and there's so much energy, right? And we see so many bold choices from a, a technical perspective, but but all in the writing, I mean, everywhere. And I think, you know, other filmmakers that we've kind of touched on, like maybe uh, Paul Thomas Anderson comes to mind with his uh, second film, Boogie Nights, is, is also very kinetic. And there's so mm -hmm. much going on with the camera and so much movement. And, um, you know, there are other I, I can't think of others off the top of my mind but it does kind of seem to be a bit of a trend where we have you know directors in their earlier films have so much of this same type of kind of energy for lack of a better word and as they mature and get older you you kind of see them and sometimes we term it we kind of term it confident 
But to kind of play devil's advocate, I, I almost, as they, sorry to finish my thought, like they become kind of more confident and the camera becomes kind of stiller and, and wider. And we kind of have scenes unfold in front of a camera that's, that's very still. And, you know, we lose a lot of that kinetic, you know, activity. Um, and, and I almost wonder, is, is that a bad thing in some ways? <laughs> like, I almost wonder why is that? It, it, and, and is it automatically necessarily a movement to a quote unquote maturity? I don't, mm -hmm. and I don't know. I, what are your thoughts on that? Cause it's, I feel like this, this is another instance now. I mean, I think one of the latest films that I've seen of Spike Lee's was black Klansman, which I thought was fantastic. Um, and and it's still uh, a lot of energy and style in that film, but it's it's quite a bit different than than uh, yeah. Know, I mean, it's interesting. And of it's course, really, it should it's something be. That I've, I've I thought think you about get my gist. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I've I, where you have oftentimes people who are really really either kinetic or um, hyper stylized in their youth, like even like someone like Spielberg, um, who who has. I think retained a lot of his like signature kind of camera movement, but also at the same time has obviously matured as a filmmaker and tackled a whole bunch of different subject matter. And, um, yeah. and, and so I think like, I don't know, it's like good thing or bad thing. It's hard to say because I, I, I think that, um, see, these are questions that I wish people would ask at those con, yeah, you know, well, like, I mean, like when, when I think about, uh, <laughs> when I think about that, I, I think Scorsese said something recently about it when he was doing an interview for, um, killers of the flower moon where he mm. kind of said like he's done that like he's he's played yeah, that side there, of him out and at this yeah. point he's not necessarily it's about the like, story he, he kind of speaking? laughed about it where he said like i'm not necessarily interested in even making a successful movie at this point i'm interested mm. in experimenting with the form as much as i can mm -hmm. um which is you know i i think that is is kind of an interesting comment too because i i would say that in a lot of ways, a lot of their earlier works, at least in my opinion, tend to be the more experimental ones anyhow. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I can totally understand I guess that's the what I'm kind of, of saying. Yeah. That's what I'm kind of saying, I guess, is that, and obviously we can't speak f for Spike Lee or Scorsese or anyone else. And, but yeah, it's just, I guess it's just a curious, you know, I, I guess I will, uh, I'll kind of, you know, be one of those It'll things where we ponder. ask the questions and there may not be answers that we have here, but it was just a question that I, it, it's kind of something I think you see amongst a lot of filmmakers as as they age and as they you know have more films under their belt and it's just interesting to me um as a filmmaker myself i'm kind of always like well geez you know does that mean if i if i made a film that was you know kinetic and had a lot of these uh elements in it does that mean it's an immature film <laughs> yeah yeah no exactly um i think that that's uh it's, it's an interesting thing to ponder and i think it's something that's kind of carried through a lot of our conversations too as yeah. you sort of said with like pta and and them, yep. Some know, others things. So. Yep. Hey, and you know what? It's it, it's just well, there may not be an answer. Uh, well, there you go. Generational differences. It's our motif here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, well, Cullen, uh, it's been a, a a pleasure to discuss, uh, do the right thing with you. Um, I've uh, I've really enjoyed it, and to everybody out there, I hope that you enjoyed our conversation as well. Of course, if you've not seen the film, you absolutely should. Uh, it's it's truly a fantastic film, and uh, you know, in it, it's as relevant today, um, in some ways, quite sadly, as it was when it was released. Um, so, still as poignant as it ever was, and maybe more so. Um, but uh, until next time, everyone, we'll catch you later. Yeah. Bye bye. <laughs>